Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. God's word for us tonight is that message from Hebrews that we read just a few moments ago. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, there were a lot of World War II movies on the weekends. So I knew a lot about you know, World War II and uh, you know, that was kind of a fun thing to, to, to read about and watch movies about as a little kid. It was always World War II, though. It wasn't World War I. Today, November 11th, uh, we call it Veterans Day. Originally, it was Armistice Day, the, the day that we remember the end of the First World War. Um, didn't realize kind of what a big deal it was until the, this strange story. I happened to be in Romania working in some orphanages back in the 90s. And uh, on the weekend, the group that we were with, our guide would take us somewhere out of the orphanage system because it was just awful. Um, and this one weekend, we went up to this remote Romanian town up in the mountains. Uh, it was somewhere outside of Dragovishta. Um, I could probably not find it on a map because the road to get there was quite windy and I didn't know which direction was north by the time we got there. But a uh, pretty little town and on the top of the hill, a very steep hill, it's a fortress that's up at the top of the hill that had been there for hundreds of years. And so our guide's telling us about how there's a stone, and the stone's about the size of, uh, about half the size of this table, probably. And uh, it's been in the town for hundreds of years, and the deal was, if you were able to carry that stone from where it was down in the village, up to the top of the fortress, you were then able to marry the mayor's daughter. It was, it was large enough that the mayor was safe. <laughs> and so was his daughter. <laughs> Apparently nobody was ever, ever able to get more than about halfway up this hill. Like I said, it was, it was very steep. So we, we, we took a hiking trail up there, and by the time we got up there, it was a beautiful view. You look around in every direction from this fortress, and it is trees and rock outcroppings and, and fields. It's just it's a gorgeous sight. But then as you look around inside the fortress, it's just a shell of its former self. And all around the outside of this fortress are what looked to me like gravestones. And I started looking at them, and they all have the same end date. In 1914. And, and as I looked closer, I realized these are all German soldiers who died on the same day in 1914. So I looked and did a little quick calculation. They're 18, 19, 20 years old. It's 144 of them that died in that place in the First World War. And that sort of got me thinking about what this war was, this war to end all wars, this war that could be now we're one and done, right? Uh, it didn't work out that way. Uh, the, uh, the last century was First World War, Second World War, Korea, Vietnam, and those are just ones that we've been involved in, and we're not doing so well in the 21st century either with wars. It was definitely not the war to end all wars. Even though the, uh, the Japanese destroyed the Russian Navy during that First World War, the Russian Navy comes back. Even though the armies of uh, the, the uh, uh, Habsburg Empire were destroyed, all those nations come back with new armies just a few years later. It's just, it's just madness. You know, they don't, still to this day, they don't really know how many people died in the First World War. It's something over 17 and a half million people. One of the reasons they don't know why is because there was an extreme cold front that came down from the north at the end of the war, blanketed much of Northern Europe was snow and ice, and uh, they couldn't find bodies afterwards. That's a lot of sacrifice. In fact, as we were up on that uh, fortress that day, the guide was talking about the sacrifice that those young German soldiers made that day. And as the more I thought about it, it really wasn't their sacrifice, but that somebody else sacrificed them for somebody else's cause. And maybe oh, it's always this way. Maybe it's always that God's like mammon. We call it the market, the economy. Maybe God's like mammon just getting control and demand that there's a sacrifice, the sacrifice of a lot of people. We're not used to thinking that way. Uh, the book of Hebrews is used to thinking that way, about sacrifice. The whole sacrificial system of Israel was about the sacrifice of all kinds of different animals, never, ever people. The Old Testament is clear about that. We sacrifice animals because we're pointing to something. If one goes sacrifice, it will be God's doing that is the undoing of all evil and death. In the Old Testament, there's a, a God called Molech. It was, it was a human sacrifice God. 
Uh, it was, uh, he had apparently a, like a bronze vision, visage and stone arms, and there was a, a log that held the arms in place. And what the, uh, what the people would do uh, when they believed Moloch needed to be satisfied was that they would build a fire on that thing, and they would place an infant in, the, in these burning arms, and then when the, the, the uh, log finally burned through, it would feed Moloch, because Moloch, Moloch has to have flesh. The God of war has to have flesh, human flesh. We're not Jewish. <clears throat> My ancestors come from Northern Europe. I took a, 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 a Ancestry.com DNA test. To absolutely no one's surprise, I'm a really white guy. <laughs> <laughs> but part of what that means is that my ancestors worshipped the gods of the forests in northern Europe. They were pagan. Human sacrifice, part of the deal. Today we, we remember a sacrifice of a lot of people. But the passage takes us to a different sacrifice. It reminds us of something else. And it is great good news. Because it tells us that in Jesus, all of the sacrifices that all of the, the world was sort of hoping that finally God would find acceptable, were found acceptable in Him. It's easy for, for us to understand this as we read through the Bible, because in the, all of the Old Testament sacrificial system, the whole of the temple system, the whole of the religious system, is a type and a shadow and a pointing forward towards something that God would do that would set free this planet from a cycle of violence and rebellion against God and death and anger. Something God would do. It was all pointing forward to that. And finally Jesus comes, the only begotten Son of God. He comes, takes on human flesh, takes all of our violence, all of our rejection of God, all of our sin against one another, all of our madness, onto his own body, bears it to the cross and into the tomb, and there leaves all that behind, so that we may live, one and done. And it says it's not like all the other sacrifices where the priest would have to come year after year with the blood of the sacrifice and, and offer it into the temple. But do you know how that worked in the Old Testament? Once a year, the high priest would come on the Day of Atonement. He would sacrifice a bull. He would bring the blood of that bull into the Holy of Holies. And he'd take a branch and he would throw it all over the inside of that place. As a propitiation, as an offering for the sin of the people. And they had to do it again and again, every year, every year. Because it was always looking forward to that time when when finally God would do something to break the spell of evil. When God would finally do something to set his people free. And while it wasn't for the same reason, all of the sacrifices of all of the religious systems all around the world have something similar in common. That if we can just do these sacrifices and do them in the right way and with enough fervor, then, then the gods will recognize us. Then the gods will get off our back. Then the gods will take the plague away. Then the gods will... Whatever. And while we'd like to think that we were people who were advanced far beyond all of that madness, uh, the writer C.S. Lewis uh, reminds us that any such thinking that we have grown morally better than those who were behind us, uh, who came before us, he calls that chronological snobbery. It's easy to look back on people in the past and think that they were rubes, that they weren't terribly intelligent, that they just weren't as smart as we are today, because on our day, of course, we don't do sacrifices. Do we? as wars come again and again. And it's just, not just at a global level either. either. We sang a song about how, how when, when dark times come, we trust in God, and this is what we long to be, the people who, when dark times to come, we trust in God. But, I know, I know because I've talked to a lot of people, and I know because I've sometimes lived through this myself, I know that when dark times come, we wonder, what did I do? That God's taking this out. What should I sacrifice? Is there something that I need to give up so it'll get better? We, we hear lots of lies about sacrifices. We, we sacrifice unborn children so that people can have better lives. It's not better lives for those unborn children. We sacrifice all kinds of things in order to get wealthier even our own families. We sacrifice all kinds of things so we'll feel better about ourselves. Even sometimes relationships with those who are close to us. Even sometimes our own faith 
we feel like we need to sacrifice this trust in this one God alone, this odd God who sent his son into human flesh. Maybe we should just put that on the back burner. Maybe we should just make such a big deal about it. We'll just sacrifice that a little bit so that, so that we can get ahead, so that we can get along. And then we're back to where we were before, always having to sacrifice something else, again and again, so that the gods will be pleased with us, so the gods will get up our back, so the gods will make sure that we've got what we need. But the passage for today reminds us that with God it's once and for all, that when God does something, he really does it right. That when he sends his son, the eternal son of God, the eternal word, the, the word through which which God spoke to create everything that exists, the word that he continued to pour out on his people to let them know that you just need to trust him, that he's got this, that the sin and death and the violence of the world, he's got this, he's going to do something about it. And that finally he does that in sending his own son, Jesus, not to wipe us out, but to gather us together as his own people. And when we live under him in faith, we live in his joy and his peace and his forgiveness forever because it is once and for all sacrifice. And he goes on to say this, if it were like all the other religions, if it were like even the religion of old Israel, Israel, then we'd have to worry that the, he would have to come back and do this again and again, and maybe, maybe he'd get tired of it, maybe he'd get tired of us, having to do this again and again. But it says this, when he comes back, it's no longer to judge, because that was done 2,000 years ago. That was done. It does not need to be repeated. No sacrifice needs to be repeated of him or of you. No sacrifice needs to be repeated. But when he comes back, it's to give salvation. You might even say, salvation is here. You might even say that all the sacrifices that we're tempted to do, they're a distraction from trusting in God. You might even say, God looks at us and sees his son and the joy of his son, even though that's hard to believe. You might even say that when he sees us, he sees us as his eternal people who will be with him forever because he will gather us together with him every day of our lives because salvation is here and it is tomorrow and it is the day after that and at the end of time because when God does something, he does it right. God did salvation right. Jesus did death and resurrection right. Jesus did the sacrifice right. Because he is holy and he is perfect and there is no more need. May God hold you in that faith. That God in Jesus has taken away your sin and your guilt. Today and tomorrow. And on the last day when he returns, he returns to welcome you as his people into life everlasting. In the name of Jesus.